There's something moving up in front of us. That's a burn. That's a burn. Right there, Greg. Get there. Next on Python Hunters. Oh, look at the injuries to that animal. This dude is not happy. The hunters get buddy. struck. <laughs> stuck. And splooged. <laughs> trying to uncover how a once-in-a-lifetime weather event this is not looking good for the berm could impact the python population <laughs> in the Everglades. Something was eating it alive. Burmese pythons have invaded Florida. To eradicate them, the states issued 15 special permits to snake experts. And these men got permits one, two, and three. Biologist Sean Heflick has been chasing, studying, and breeding reptiles his entire life. I've never been afraid of snakes. Exotic reptile breeder and cop Greg Graziani knows his pythons inside and out. I got my first Burmese python when I was 12 years old. Python breeding pro Michael Cole has sold his designer color mutations for as much as $25,000. I've learned about reptiles the hard way. I didn't go to school for it. It was a passion. Now, these snake breeders are defending the Everglades. They are the Python Hunters. Recently, reports of python sightings have fallen off sharply. The hunters are investigating why. Hey guys, I got a burn. Bad shape. Oh man, something's been eating him. He's alive. He's very much alive. Look at that. Look at the injuries to that animal. Oh my, watch, watch. <laughs> you got it? Bad Something soul. literally ate this while it was alive. While it was alive, couldn't get away. Wow. Dude, when I looked down, I thought it was a dead berm. Because all I saw was well, this I portion of the tail. I don't know, it's been chewed on hard. I mean, big time, almost, almost down to the bone. This animal had some spunk to it. And yeah, when I grabbed it, it took off. How tough these things This are. is actually truly horrific. It is, but scientifically very, very interesting. I think this is an incredible find because we are doing research. This isn't about just catching them and removing them. We need to study them. We need to find out what they're doing. Nature does funny things, as you just saw. This python could have fallen victim to one of the Everglades' most notorious scavengers. Is, is this animal bite, Sean? If you look at the beaks on vultures, they're tough. I mean, they are designed to rip flesh. See this? Boom. That's Boom. a mouth. Yeah. Boom. Boom. That's chunks taken you out. Know, just chunks after chunks. I will lay Eat money them. that when this thing was cold in a catatonic state almost, something was picking it. Something just came up and, and was eating it alive. But I want to measure the, the, the width and the length of, of the injuries. Yeah. Um, and placements. He's all messed up. I'll be honest with you, I, I'd like to uh, actually set him up and see how well this animal would survive. With all those scars? Yeah. An animal to, to sustain that kind of wound and survive is amazing. Head temp is 80.8. It's been laying there for the last 15 minutes, warming up, catching the sun rays, and now it's got enough energy to try to get away again. Look at that. It's ready to go. You got to get it. You got to bag it up. You know, with the severity of those wounds and the fact that there was no necrosis and it had already started to heal itself, that's a good indicator that these animals are resilient. You know, there's a lot that, that uh, either the environment or man can dish out to them, and, and they can survive it. One more gone from the Everglades. The injured berm will now get a chance to recover in Greg's lab. We're going to take care of this snake here and see just how bad the wounds are because a wound like this for any other animal would normally be fatal. If this animal is able to survive, it's going to let us know that they are a lot tougher than, than we believe. The Burmese python evolved in the full tropical climate of Southeast Asia. 
and it seems to have trouble adapting to Florida's colder weather. The difference between a cold-blooded animal like this Burmese python and, and mammals, which are warm-blooded, is this animal cannot regulate its own body temperature. It has to find sunlight during the day to raise its temperature. It will seek the sun, it'll get on hot rocks or pavement, and with the coloration on this skin being very dark pigmented, it absorbs heat extremely quickly, raising the core temperature of this animal. Once that occurs, this animal has the energy to defend itself, hunt, digest, and have its immune system work properly. Up until now, the South Florida Everglades has proven an ideal territory for the invasive Burmese python. It's kilometer after kilometer of hot, humid, perfect snake habitat. Originally from the jungles of Southeast Asia, the pythons easily travel through the shallow waters of the glades. Perfectly camouflaged, they can disappear into the grassy landscape, ready to ambush one of dozens of local prey species. The hunters want to know what left this highly evolved predator so defenseless that it could be nearly eaten alive. They have a hunch. Florida is experiencing some of its worst weather in almost a half century, a cold snap. The coldest winter in 30 years means temperatures up to 20 degrees below normal. Crops are freezing on the trees. Cold-blooded animals like snakes are especially vulnerable. Without warm shelter, they risk dying of exposure. And the weather isn't just threatening Florida's alien species population. According to state officials, it's also having a catastrophic effect on native and endangered species. We have a thousand manatees that were killed. We found a hundred crocodiles, American crocodiles, in their native habitat down here in the saltwater, edge of the saltwater, were killed. The bonefish, the, you know, the love bonefish you go fly fishing for, dead by the thousands. We had to put a closure on snook and tarpon and bonefish. The cold weather's upon us. It's dipping down you know, pretty quick now that that sun's setting. We had the uh, animals out getting the sun. But once the sun gets off of them, it's, uh, it's just too cold, you know? Sean and his son, Thorne, rushed to get their exotic animals undercover. For most of the year, Florida's climate is nearly perfect. Cold again. I gotta come inside. For animals that evolved to live in tropical forests, like the Burmese python. But the short winter here can be hard. And this one is the worst in 30 years. Cover the tortoises up, get them in their hay. Thorne grew up surrounded by cold-blooded creatures, a willing and able assistant sharing his dad's fascination with reptiles. They're from Africa, so they typically burrow down where the cold weather can't get to them at night. So we have to cover them up with hay and a blanket. Got them tucked in? Mm-hmm. Thanks, I appreciate it. Now everyone's speculating what the impact of the cold snap has been on the invasive Burmese python. They don't belong here. They're outside of the range, and the cold will kill them. It's going to be very interesting to find out how the wild population does. If I had to you know, make an educated guess, I'd say that they're going to lose some snakes. And uh, the ones that do survive, it's going, to, it's going to put them in a bad way. The hunters want to find out how badly the pythons have been hit by the cold. They also want to test a controversial theory on Burmese python spread. A report from the U.S. Geological Survey suggests that these invaders could spread from South Florida across a third of the U.S. The hunters want to know if the cold can stop their spread. For if the pythons can't survive this, then there's little chance of them surviving further north. Looks like this winter is just going to present a golden opportunity. They got to be getting hit hard with this winter this far north. The bulk of the pythons that we found down in this area, I think where we need to check is uh, north of 41 and south of 75, which is going to be right in this general area. We've caught a couple of pythons here, but we need to see you know, how far north are they actually going and how many are actually there. They're heading north, deep into the remote tree island areas of the Everglades. And to get around those parts, they'll need help. Let me give a call to Captain Shaw and see if we can get the use of his airboat. He was raised out here and he's a glazeman. He can probably knock it all out far easier than we can map it out.
for the guys. Hunting in the ever-changing Everglades can be an adventure in navigation. So when they need a gladesman, they call on Captain Sean Myman. Gladesman's a person that has a desire and a strong love for the Everglades. There's no secret handshake. It's just a, a more of a comfort level. You spend enough time out here, and it really becomes a part of you. You know, I couldn't imagine life without it. In the Florida Everglades, species survival is delicately balanced. Here, animals and habitats rely on the water. It may span across 1.5 million acres, but it's only three meters at its deepest. The best way to traverse these marshes is by airboat. This flat-bottomed watercraft with a powerful engine is designed to skim the shallow waters. The hunters sit up high with a clear view of any wildlife. And when they spot it, this vessel can turn on a dime. Captain Sean delivers the hunters to a remote tree island area where few people ever tread. The hunters believe it'll have the ideal conditions for pythons. Hey man, this area over here is perfect. Look at the sunlight coming through here. Well, there are holes all over the place on this thing for, for rodents and that. Let's see what we can find on this while the sun's still hitting us. Yeah, this is nice. The hunters are beginning to wonder if any pythons survive the cold snap. Oh, what you got? Bob, oh, vertebrae. That's a good sized python. That's bigger than anything we've seen so far. Vertebrae. Yeah, yeah there's ribs all over the ground here. Yeah, yeah look at this. this. Yeah, a massive snake. Look at the width on that. The size of the rib cage indicates a massive python. That is going to be a big animal. Oh, look at this. Oh, yeah. Skull? What you got? No, I got no, jawbone. He's, he's got bottom jawbone. Ouch. Look at those teeth. I mean, that's a big animal. Potentially, that's 15 foot plus. This might be the biggest snake we've encountered thus far. The longest Burmese python ever found in the Everglades was just over five meters. In the wild, male berms typically grow to three meters and females to four meters plus. This one was probably as large as they get, but even at that size, something was able to defeat this giant snake. Ribs everywhere. Some of them busted. So what do you think? Something was preying on this snake? In normal conditions, a snake that size would be formidable. After seeing this, Sean develops a theory. The cold must be hitting the bigger pythons harder, slowing them down, making them easy prey. Ribs don't just inadvertently break for no reason. They're tough. Well, you know what? This is all cool, but I'm going to hunt some live snakes. <laughs> you guys have fun with the bones. Well, I'm, I'm torn. You know how much I love bones. I'll tell you what. From my you skull. hang here with your skeleton, <laughs> and Michael and I, he's already ahead of us out there in the sunlight where something's going to be laying. OK, if I don't go, y'all ain't going to catch squat, so I'm going to go with you so you actually have a hunter with you. All right, Slowpoke, you ready? Oh, more pythons. That's a whole different snake at this distance. Oh, yeah. Let's, uh, let's get GPS. This graveyard holds a lot of data for the hunters on Python's survival. So this thing's been picked clean. But they're a long way from home and running out of time before sunset. This is uh, not looking good for the berms out here. I mean, uh, with this cold front that's come through, we're finding, you know, carcass after carcass here. You know, the worst part is we're running out of sunlight. Yeah, well, I'm hurrying here, man. You know, if you can't keep up, we're going to have to get a better secretary. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> the python hunters are adjusting their strategy with the cold temperatures. They're wondering where the snakes could have gone. And to find out, they're taking deep cover. Oh, dude, go back there. It's a whole big old pit. Maybe it's a... Wow. It's bigger than I thought. Sinkhole cave or something? Let's check it out. Oh, yeah, look at that. What do we got? Uh, look, small cave there. Oh, yeah, boy. I love caves. Man, talk about a place where pythons could be hiding out when it gets cold. Scattered throughout the Everglades are islands known as hammocks. 
trees have colonized the top of these slightly raised limestone shelves. Wow. Incredible. But the story is sometimes below the surface. You guys aren't going to believe this. It's just wide open. It's a beautiful cave. You got to get down here and check this out. Oh, well, this is awesome, dude. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is cool. Look at these roots. This is like back in time. Let's get some temps in here. All right, we're at 54 degrees there. So it's actually, you know, a little bit warmer down in the bottom of this cave. Now, I don't know how much body heat we're throwing off. What you're going to find is that uh, because we're underground, the rock, the walls, the dirt acts like a perfect natural insulator. This is prime real estate for snakes, man. You know, so if it's, if it's 30 degrees outside and it's 54 in here, it's over 20 degrees difference, you know, for the positive. So, you know, this makes for a, a great little micro refugia where they can get in out of the cold and, and uh, you know, wait for it to pass. So for those of us without the letters behind our name, can you define micro refugia? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, micro refugia, uh, you know, just like it sounds, micro, to, it's a small refuge. You know, it's an area where animals seek um, to take, you know, seek refuge and safety. So, I'm looking it up. <laughs> yeah, right. No. When we get above ground, I'm looking it up. I don't believe you. The hunters know the pythons are out here, seeking heat during this cold snap but they just can't seem to find them. They head out to the warm, rural roads, hoping their luck will improve. Oh, wait, 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 snake, snake. Where? Back, Where? back, back. Dead. Came across the snake, thought it was alive, it was dead, it was kind of one of those, well, let's get, you know, the information anyway. Uh, uh, it's a berm. Yeah. Damn it, this is a good size good berm, size too. too. That thing's been thumped and rolled on this road. With the cold, uh, it appears the animal's trying to find as much heat as possible on the roadway. <laughs> That's uh, 10 feet, two and a half inches. That's a good size animal. Look, yeah, look how skinny it is. What uh, you got, Tim? 69.9. 69.9? Yeah. This has been dead for a while. Yeah. And the ground, 69.1. That's more than six degrees below normal for a berm. <laughs> like all reptiles, pythons can't thermoregulate the way mammals do so their environment determines their temperature. Oh, look at that. This snake was sick. We open up the mouth and we realize that uh, it does appear to have some mucosis in there mixed with some blood due to the cold weather causing the respiratory infection in it. Look at that, it, you know what? It looks like that stuff's been coming out of its epiglottis as well. And then they get a little sick from the cold. And then it kind of turned comical on us because uh, as we're getting measurements and everything, Sean says to Michael, you know, why don't you get a sex on it? Male, female, what we got? Typically, in a live snake, you might get a little, you know, a little musk, but you know, you get the the hemipedal inversion, and that's that. You can tell if it's a male or a female, and you go on your way. I've never sexed a dead snake before. When I squeezed it, went. <laughs> the musk gland just squirts right in his face. <laughs> the odor coming out of that was horrific. I'm laughing hysterically and gagging at the same time. <laughs> and, the best part, and the best part is he did it to himself. <laughs> and he just poured it being a piece. Don't do it. I thought he was going to blow chunks. <laughs> and he'd go, uh, uh. It was the most hysterical thing. Dude, I've been lost before. I've been a dead snake. <laughs> it was a lesson very well learned. By the taste of things, how old would you say this animal is, uh, Michael? <laughs> Four. Four. Outstanding. From my position, it was funny. Hey, Michael, <laughs> is it male or female? Next person that asks me about that shit, I'm going to pop in the face. <laughs> After being splooched, Michael leaves to get the stench off his face and clothes. Greg and Sean are heading out looking for python survivors. Sean! 
What? Real. Man, don't let him ditch in that water. He looks a little. Whoa, whoa. whoa. No, this thing is pitiful. This thing is not moving. He has absolutely no power. I mean, I look at this. He's just, he is dehydrated. I've never seen a snake this skinny. Look at the pelvic yeah. girdle right here is sticking out on this animal. It looks like he's been mushed by a car. He is so flat. Look at this, Greg. He's like laterally compressed. He's so skinny. He's got no muscle tone. He's in bad shape. Let's see if we got any upper respiratory going on here. Oh, look at that. Look at this. Look at this. See that? Bloody mucosal. Oh, look. He's, he's got a little bit of stomatitis right there. See that? Ooh, look at this. Look at oh, that yeah, chunk yeah, coming yeah, out of yeah, the thing. Yeah. The snake experts recognize an infection of the mucous membranes, a telltale sign of a depressed immune system, and a fatal cold weather malady. Well, if that's the case, that, that's due to the cold. This is really an example, though, of what this extreme cold snap has done. Um, some of them got hit hard right away. Some of them have upper respiratories and other problems associated with the cold, and they're just, uh, they're just fighting. We've never caught a python in this poor shape. I mean, we got a cold spell coming in right now. This this animal, nah, he's he would not be long for this world. Uh, whether we caught him or not, he just just wouldn't be around for very long. He's on his way out. With the dead dead animals we're finding, and with the really sick animals from that cold snap, our numbers just went to one side. We were looking at about 50-50 live and dead. Not but anymore. Within the last couple of days, we've jacked it way up. With 68 off the head. This berm is cold now and will only become colder as the night wears on. You know, we need to get these out of here, but I hate to see anything so yeah, like this. Yeah, no doubt. As a biologist, Sean wants to know how wild Burmese pythons cope with below freezing temperatures. He sets up an outdoor study sanctioned by Florida Fish and Wildlife to observe seven captured constrictors. They've got plenty of cover. Um, they can get deep down in here, blocks the, blocks the wind, blocks a lot of the, the elements, takes the, the edge off of it, but uh, they're not doing well. We're uh, just a couple days into this study, and whoosh, they're cold. You know, we're gonna let this project go for, um, for a couple more days and, and ride it out, see what the, the temperature does out there. As soon as the sun comes out, the guys do too. You know, being out these last couple of times, not finding any pythons and, and very few native reptiles is kind of discouraging at this point. But the hunters are determined to find signs of life. They know that morning is the best time to see any of the 29 species of snake living in the Everglades. Slip on that, and you're three hours from somebody who can sew a testicle back on. <laughs> Even one of the four venomous species. Snake? Yeah? You got it? You got it. There we go. Hey, little buddy. Oh, wow. Is that a black or a blue? You ever talk about the brown nose, you know, blacks? Yeah. This species isn't venomous. The black racer is one of the most common native snakes in the Everglades, but this one's in trouble. Yeah, feel it. He's almost same, impacted right here, though. Same species. Feel that, Sean? Wow, that's hard. Isn't it? I'm telling you, if we don't clear that, this animal probably won't survive. Snakes can swallow prey up to four times their own width, whole. Digestion can take days to weeks and requires an incredible amount of the animal's energy. Intestinal impactions can occur when conditions are poor and can be deadly. Yeah, there's a lot of liquid coming out. I'm just gonna let him go. I'm gonna let the probe out for a second here. Oh, that's foul. That's Ooh. not. Uh, that's some perfume. It's well, it's almost like septic. Yeah. Well, if he didn't clear this, he'd a be dead. Little bit there's, of feces. There's... That's what's just crazy hard. There How's it feel to save his life there? Well, it's good. It's what that's we do. It's a beautiful animal. Look how dry this is. Yeah, he'd have never passed that. There's crazy. no way. The digestive enzymes need a certain temperature to be able to really process it at optimal. Um, and, you know, with this cool weather, it, it's just not getting that. A lot, of, a lot of these snakes aren't, so it caused a massive impaction down there. 
but uh, it's clear now, so he, he's got a long life ahead of him, hopefully. When you look at the North American snakes, they have evolved in this environment, in this system, and they hibernate. They just basically go into a, a almost catatonic state um, during the cold months, and then when it warms up, they emerge, you know, into the warmth, into the heat, and they go through their reproductive events. Burmese python has not evolved with that capacity. The Everglades is surrounded by a rough, dense terrain, a protective habitat for many wetland birds, mammals, and reptiles. The perfect place for opportunistic predators like pythons. Whoa, 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 stay right there. Right here, right here. I'm going to bring right over. Out the other side. The <laughs> half. I was watching out your side and almost ran right over the little monster. Coming out from the uh, sawgrass. Look at this. Look at this pile of rocks back there behind us. Oh, he might have been moving right out of there. Oh, this dude is not happy. Yeah, look at that. Let's get uh, temp real quick before you hit him up. 84. 84, so he's been outside a little bit. The Burmese python's ideal body temperature is in the upper 20s Celsius. He's got good muscle to him. He looks all right. Get ready for a stretch. 87 total. The data they collect on each capture will help state wildlife officials better understand the extent of the python problem and how to manage it. Let's take a new data measurement we don't typically take. Let's take a girth at what we think is the widest part of the body to show how healthy the snakes are. Yeah, let's get that. I think eighth and a quarter right on the money. When you look at this one, I would expect this snake to be good nine to 10 inches in girth and captivity. You know, for, for a wild animal, he's healthy wild weight. Oh, yeah. he's definitely, he's, he's, he's in excellent shape. He's got, got him, he's uh, headed out again. Yeah, he's, he's wanting, to, wanting to cruise and grab that bag, let's get him bagged up. And... During a capture, the python will expend its energy quickly in defense. For a period, it's almost completely docile until it's worked up enough strength to try to escape again. We still need to have a release on top of a capture, do we? Let's not get some spray in there. <laughs> we know how you like those ends, yep, man. I want to temp gun those rocks. Yep, Let's see what right the right temp here. is on those. Yeah, the temperature on these rocks are elevated. We're getting readings at, you know, seven, eight degrees higher than the surrounding. This is some great cover right here, actually. Oh, man, there's all kind of crevices and holes in there. Nothing big is going to be in there. The tiny crevices in the protective rock habitat probably save this smaller python. Oh, what's that? What? Ah, I got a Burmese python circus. Jerry? Yep. But no such luck for the larger snakes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a big animal. This one's dead. That's more evidence supporting the hunter's theory that the small animals are surviving the cold better. A large python would take a lot longer to get its core temperature where it needed to be to be active. At the same time, it's going to lose energy a lot quicker if it has to exert it. The smaller pythons can heat up much quicker, and that's why they tend to be faring better in the cold weather. No doubt. Look at that. Still got a little bit of flavor, huh? That one, though, uh... That, no, this is crazy. We, <laughs> what's wrong, Michael? Michael's gonna vomit on me. Did you uh, get any in your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm wondering what kind of animal preyed upon this python. This, well, is, a, this is a large python. I'm, I'm guesstimating this python to be 14 feet or so. It's about as large as wild pythons get. The bigger they get, the bigger prey they need, from rats to rabbits on up. They are efficient predators, digesting everything but small amounts of hair from their victims. Deer? Oh, right by your foot. Look at that. What is that? Right here. Is that deer? No, it's not deer. It's wild hog. Hey, there's it's more than over pig. here. Whatever, it, it, that, that makes sense, because this was a large animal. Look at all this. Yeah. He ate something as large as, a, as a, a wild pig down here. This animal needed to get a lot of sun to help digest that meal is going to make them extremely sluggish. It's going to make them very vulnerable. Right, but what's the one animal that's really common in this system that can bust and crack ribs 
of a 14 foot plus python. Those are the gators. Those are the gators, no doubt. No doubt. Meet the giant pythons match, the American alligator. It's the apex predator of the Everglades, numbering in the millions. Water. This weather's turning bad, guys. Yeah. When that, just a couple of minutes ago, it was like a 10 degree drop, just wham, like somebody had opened the freezer yeah. door. The hunters have to get out of here before the storm arrives. But getting to a hunting habitat and getting out can be two very different things. All right, I'll push. You're going to haul ass and bust through the front of that. Oh, <laughs> oh my boots were stuck under the muck. <laughs> At the southern edge of the python hunter's recent hunting territory is a much busier snake habitat, the Tamiami Trail. Determined to hook a live giant, the hunters check this well-known python habitat. At dusk, this is where cold-blooded creatures lounge around the asphalt to absorb the heat from the day. Scott! Dead burp. It used to be a berm. Now it's a coiled corpse. This is a prime example of what's happened during this cold snap and these freezes because it's coiled up tightly, trying to get some sun, trying to warm itself up, I presume, and uh, it just didn't make it. We can get a, a fairly good idea of the size of this snake from doing simple morphometrics. Um, you know, you, you take the, the length of the skull and then you you extrapolate the, to the length of a, of a wild snake, and, and uh, we can cross-reference that with other information we have. Sean's calculations put this snake at just over three meters. Definitely check out the teeth on this, though, but, up close, which is really cool. Yeah, I know. It, it's got a fair set of chompers there. If you were a marsh rabbit or a wood rat, you know, uh, that's the last thing you'd want to see coming at you. But if you saw that, it's too late. Oh, yeah. There you go. That's the good stuff right These, there. A lot of the intestines and that are still here. You can see the fat in the pot. So look at this. Look at this. Yep. Yeah, this was a healthy man. He just he wasn't able to find covered. refuge. Yep. So this is another uh, victim of the weather. Yeah, it's got to be. I mean, this, you know, nothing killed this. Nothing tore to pieces. Uh, nobody ran over it. This python's warming move has backfired. Positioning itself near the pavement actually exposed this big beast to the elements freezing it in its tracks. Our, our theory that smaller berms may Do possibly better. doing better. Here's a good size animal, plenty yeah. of fat stores. You know, it didn't make it. Thus far, I think our hypothesis is, you know, holding up. We'll see as, as the days go yep. by. The hunters have discovered when it comes to pythons surviving the cold, size matters. But they're still not sure why. We're good to go. Let's find a live one now. We've caught live ones since the cold snap, and uh, we found dead ones. So the population's certainly not uh, knocked out of the ball game, but uh, it's probably knocked back a bit. South Florida's long cold snap is playing havoc with many reptile species. All right, this is really interesting here. Uh, we we uh, found a, a yellow belly turtle laying eggs in the front of the facility here. And it was a long time of the year. She laid them in November. Now, being that these guys are normally born in the spring to summertime, being born in the wintertime here and the strange weather that we've had, uh, this would have probably been 100% fatality rate for these little turtles. So I went out, I, I dug up the eggs, and I uh, incubated them. And I've never incubated turtle eggs before, so it was pretty exciting for us. And here, we've actually got one out already. Um, these are the last two stragglers right here. We've got, got one still in the egg here. And normally, these turtles would hatch underground. And then these little guys would have a huge trek through the pasture back to the water. And if you can see the tip of the snout, you will see the egg tooth right at the tip of his nose there. It's a very light colored, uh, and it almost feels like a little shard of glass 
Um, all of the reptiles uh, that hatch out have these little egg teeth, and that's how they cut through the eggs. So uh, we've been lucky enough to, to get nine out of the 12 to hatch, and uh, we'll raise these guys up to about three or four inches so they got a better chance out there in the wild, and then we'll bring them down to the local ponds here on the property and, and turn them loose. So uh, it's a great story, great ending for these little turtles that uh, wouldn't have even had a chance. Cold-blooded animals are completely dependent on their environment. But Greg's been amazed before by the python's ability to bounce back from a freeze. What we used to do years ago, and we don't anymore for euthanization, is actually putting some of these reptiles in the freezer. And uh, we had an injured python that I put in the freezer for eight hours solid. Took that animal out of the freezer, and four hours later, it crawled away. So for short periods of freezing temperature, these animals can survive. During normal South Florida temperatures, pythons can thrive and fight back. Wrestling 10 feet of muscle with a head the size of a grapefruit that's home to 100 teeth can be tricky. But these are experts. This is wild Burmese python, and, and this is a typical scenario that we find ourselves in when we catch them. Try to get him by the tail. Kind of tease him out. <laughs> now, let's get her away from the water. Once they figure out that, that they're not going anywhere, then uh, a lot of times they'll come right back on you. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Especially when they're really warm. You gotta get them behind the head. Um, they're real nimble. They can turn on you pretty good, so you just get it up. Got him? Oh, yeah. There we go. All right. You take a bite every now and then. That's to be expected. Um, the intent is not to get bit ever. What the but you see, they go ahead and wrap that, that, those coils around them. That's a lot for support and leverage as well. And then uh, they'll try to pull out of your hand. And you see, slowly draw, trying to draw himself back, gain that leverage to get out of my grasp. Try to keep that tail away from you, because that's, that's, uh, that's the business end. Sometimes they evacuate, you know, that urine and, and that feces and the, and the must on you. That's ah, spewing all over the place. She get you? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I personally would rather get bitten um, because it's foul, but that's the life of a python hunter. What in the hell? Dude, you can't put snake heads in my cup holder, OK? I think the problem is you've misidentified my snakehead holder as For your my drink cup holder. holder. Yeah. Well. <laughs> to test their theory on python survival skills, the hunters break out their new toy. Hey, we're bringing the snake cam. Yeah. No, no, no. It's not a trouser snake cam. <laughs> Nobody wants to see that. Uh, yeah, this isn't a macro. This isn't a magnifying glass. <laughs> yeah, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. This funny, is funny. Work. The hunters have rigged a small camera to the end of a flexible tube. This spy cam will allow them to investigate places where Burmese pythons may seek refuge from the cold snap and help determine what happened to the snakes. Is that a good spot? Uh, thanks, sir. <laughs> Here we go. There's leaf litter and stuff in there, so it's not active. I can't see anything down there. And that goes way back in there. Anything in there? Rodent burrow, looks like. And uh, it's all cleared out. Hey, look at this. What you got? Snake skeleton. Or part of one. Big vertebrae and ribs. Holy moly. Yeah, that's a berm, no doubt. Oh, another, oh. another victim to the cold. Well, as big as that is, it's shallow. What I'd like to find is deeper ones. Yeah? Um, you know, it's all about energetics. You know, if they can't, A, secure enough food and thus energy to survive, they certainly can't B, reproduce. And if they can't reproduce, they can't C, establish a population. I need to actually sit down and tally our numbers since the cold snap and get a real percentage on the 
Well, I think we got enough information here. Let's go ahead and area where we think we might find some live pythons. This python became frozen dinner for ants and worms. But a few more dips down the road, the hunters discover signs of health in a hole. I'm trying to get a better angle. It looks like, uh, looks like a snake shin. Check this out. In the sun, you see yeah. that? Looks like a berm shed. So there's bits and pieces of it torn in there, so. I mean, it's real fresh. If that's a shed, ants and the other ant critters will get to that and be gone in two days or less. That's definitely a Burmese shed. I mean, we got a snake around here then. Yeah. Finally, signs of life. After finding a freshly shed python skin, the hunters know there's a live snake in the area. Turtle eggs. Matter of fact, you can see where the nest was dug up. Turtle egg shells around it. That means there's definitely Burmese python food here because, you know, raccoons, possums, they're eating the turtle eggs. Greg needs to get out of my head because that's exactly what I was thinking is where there are turtle egg predators, that means there's prey for Burmese python. Look, there's something moving up there. There's something moving up in front of us. That's a berm. That's a berm. Right there, Greg, get there. He's going toward you. When the sun finally comes out, the python hunter spots something glistening in the grass. Oh, he knows you're there. Look at yeah, the tail. Yeah, he knows him. Look at his tail going. He's wagging that tail. That animal is Tom aggravated Flicky. right now. He Look had a him. nice sun spot, and as soon as we come through that right there, he he's just started moving. He came out of a hole around here somewhere. I guarantee it. Uh, he's got his head covered right now, and he, he doesn't see us, so he's, he's pretty calm. He's like, almost invisible. And that's not very much grass he was in, either. No. Look at that. Oh, look yeah, at him. See, the now the sun comes back out. Yeah, look, look at him. He shines like a diamond. Yep. Look when he this. moved, all I got was like a reflection glint off the scales. If he'd have stayed stationary like this, we could have walked right over him. Even though this isn't its native home, the python's camouflage helps to avoid predators. Over yeah, here. just drag him out. Here. Drag him out in the open. Come here, buddy. Oh, yay. And when that doesn't work, oh, yeah. he is upset. it's a feat of physics. A snake uses almost half its body in a defensive strike, and it takes just a sixth of a second to happen. Yeah, he feels that heat coming off my hand. Sure does. Oh, oh yeah. Just want to get he away. forgot about me completely. You guys are moving enough. Yeah. OK, maybe not completely. <laughs> Ooh, get that tooth on there. Come on. Nice try. Try. <laughs> you can get it. Yeah, you can get it. Around. Look at that. Look at that flesh. Look at that. That animal is beautiful. It's a decent looking look animal. That. Yeah, look weight wise. Yeah. But one of the smaller ones we've seen out here, and we look at these holes that we've been finding. Perfect That's a perfect diameter. size to get in there. He could he could get in those crevices. It feels pretty empty. Little spurs. That's a girl. Yeah, he is. And we got 85. Seven and a half, Greg. Seven and a half on the girth. The measurements indicate she's young and healthy. 86, 87. That's ideal python body temperature. And this snake's lean and mean, all of which have helped her to survive the Florida freeze. It's an important discovery. Who actually caught that one? What's that? I grabbed it first. You saw it first. You get to carry it. Oh, we'll just share it. Wait, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Kidding? <laughs> Wildlife officials think between 3,000 and 100,000 pythons live here. Even if it's possible that 50% succumb to the cold, there's still a huge python problem in the glades. Greg's hunting style is a little different than mine in that uh, he doesn't catch as many animals. Bandit, bandit, right there. Stop. Bandit Stop. water snake right there. Stop, right down on the, on the rocks. We're both go-getters. You know, if anything, we're racing each other to the snakes. And you know, it's a friendly knockdown drag out to see who gets there first. Holy cow, look at that gator. Jesus. What a hook dick. Come on, get in there. Son of a bitch. Snake. I got this fair and square. Fair and square, you bailed out of the boat on <laughs> Look at that gator. Look at that. You didn't see the gator? Yeah, yeah, I saw see the, the gator. gator. Yeah, I got that fair and Look square. At that. But he's a little sneaky about slipping out, trying to get that one up again on the numbers. 
No, this is a brown water snake. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was abandoned at first, but this is a gorgeous brown water oh, snake. Oh, no, not again. You got your phone? <laughs> That's why I don't have a leather one, for just that reason. Uh, you know, there's one good thing about this, Greg. You're going to be freaking miserable the rest of the day. <laughs> The sun is back in Florida, and temperatures approach near normal. But after almost two straight weeks of lows below 10 degrees Celsius, the coldest winter in 30 years has killed thousands of animals in the Everglades. At Sean's place, his wife Jen and son Thorne get their exotic animals out for some much needed basking. Meanwhile, the python hunters try to turn their data into conclusions. We're subtropical. And that's the tip of Florida. These animals have evolved and come from Southeast Asia, which is full on tropical climate. The farthest north animals we found are in very poor condition. And now all the way down into the south, we're, we're finding just as many dead animals as we are live ones now after this, this cold front has gone through. Extended periods of cold is, uh, is a death warrant for them. Sean knows firsthand about the effects of cold on pythons. He conducted a series of state-sanctioned cold weather experiments on the serpents. Well, it's uh, it's colder than it's not out here. That's what I found. But um, you know, it's the it's the morning of the fourth day. There's absolutely no response. Uh, I don't see any breathing. 26, 27 degrees. That's head temp on this animal. They are icicle cold. Magnificent animals but they just can't take sustained cold like this. Six of the seven snakes perished in the cold. The seventh died later from a resulting upper respiratory infection. I don't see how all this talk about them making their way up to Georgia and the Carolinas and then to Virginia and on up to Washington has any merit at all. So you're saying we're not gonna have pythons crawling across the White House lawn in 10 years? No, not at all. Don't believe they're going to be crawling across the governor's mansion's lawn in, in Florida or Georgia either. The very southern tip of Florida is the only thing that's going to support these animals. These respiratory infections with their immune system down could take months to take its toll on these pythons. So we got a lot more data to get out there and collect. But these giant snakes have also shown an incredible ability to battle back. Oh, yeah. I think they're resilient. I think uh, the fact that we are finding, you know, a number of them still alive means that they're, they're not down and out totally. We found that one Burmese python that got into that cold state, that catatonic state, and those vultures just you know picked a 15 inch by four inch uh, chunk of meat out of that thing. As part of a fully sanctioned experiment, Greg okay. took the python back to his reptile facility. There, he enlisted his son Lane in helping with its recovery. They gave the ravaged wild berm water and a warm, dry spot to recover from its wounds. I'm going to pass it off to you, all right, Lane, so I can inspect the body on this guy again. Still acting like that wild berm. Can you get him under here? Slide under my hand. When Lane's at school, he's got such a reputation for dealing with wildlife I mean, when you got him. that any time they've got a snake or something in the playground, they call him out of class to come catch it. All right, look at this. Well, look how good he's healing. And that was raw muscle last time. So this is where a bunch of them ate part of his skin right off, and then they pecked throughout his body. And we caught that animal from the nose all the way around this eye. It looked totally damaged. And after this animal has shed out, you can see he's got a little bit of scar tissue around the eye, so he's missing this big scale right here around that one eye. But other than that, everything else is healing perfectly on this animal. That's amazing. What do you think? I think he's doing good. Here's yeah. a maggot. That's but, good, isn't that, it? Yeah, that is good. You know why that's good? Because they eat the dead skin off. That's exactly right. That's amazing to show the resilience of these animals. So, I mean, I don't think by any means uh, we've wiped these things out. So I think we can all agree that having a cold event that would totally eradicate them is, is probably not going to happen. So we're still going to have to manage these animals. You know, we've collected a lot of data. It's adding up. It's putting the, you know, the pieces in the puzzle, the pieces in the puzzle. But there's still a lot of more data to collect. You know, as strange as it sounds, it's really a dance between us and the python. The python doesn't necessarily uh, dance to the tune we have in mind. 
Sometimes we step on each other's toes. You know, that's, that's the life of a python hunter.